My name's Alan Smith. I work as an aero engineer, um, and I'm going to give you a talk on the crossover between Formula One and America's Cup racing from my aero engineering perspective. I need to start with an admission, and that admission is I really don't know that, that much about sailing. Um, but hopefully, over the next half an hour, you'll see why I'm giving you a talk. And the place to start is with my background. Uh, I started work about uh, 30 years ago with a company called Reynard that designed Indy cars. These are the uh, cars that are raced on the big ovals in America. It was very popular at the time, and it's a great place to start as a young engineer. You get thrown in at the deep end at quite a high level of aero engineering, and you learn the trade. And we were successful. We were being a bit arrogant. We were pretty good at it. We won titles with uh, Jacques Villeneuve, Alessandro Zanardi, Juan Montoya, there's a guy called Jimmy Vassa that won as well. It was a great grounding. I then moved to Formula One, the big time. And that was a bit of a grind for a few years. But eventually, in 2004, we got ourselves up into second place in the Constructors' Championship behind Ferrari. And then eventually won a race. The first race we won was in 2006. So this is 13 years after I started in the sport. And then in 2009, uh, the, the team had morphed into Braun GP, and we won the World Championship with Jensen Button. Really, really great achievement. We, were, uh, we had a good season. Now, at this point, I'd been working for a long time in Formula One and decided I would like to do something a little bit different and decided to become a freelance engineer. wanted to just do other projects. They were still mainly in motor racing, but... I could pick and choose how I worked a little bit. And I worked in lots of different projects, but I'm going to mention two because they're relevant to how I got into America's Cup racing. So the first project was designing or doing the groundwork for the aero design of the 2014 championship winning Mercedes. And the other project that came across, came along a couple of years later, a year later, was working on a touring car for the German touring car series. Now, the key thing here is that both of these projects were for Mercedes. How I got into the America's Cup uh, racing was I was in a pub and I was talking to a colleague and uh, he mentioned that Mercedes Formula One were tying up with Ineos Team UK on the America's Cup yacht and they were potentially looking for aero engineers. Perfect. Um, I rang Mercedes up. Went to see them the next day, and about a week later, I'm stood looking at a prototype of America's Cup yacht down in Portsmouth. A little bit daunting. Um, I then worked for um, Ineos Team UK for just over a year. So again, I don't know a huge amount about sailing. But I did figure out quite a lot of similarities, and there are a lot of reasons why a Formula One team and an America's Cup team would tie themselves together. So these similarities. First one, they're both big, high-end, big money, highly technical sports. And they're also sports where each competitor needs to design, manufacture, and operate their own equipment. You can't go and buy, or at the time, you couldn't go and buy an America's Cup yacht. You can't go and buy a Formula One car. You have to do it all yourself. So the level of the engineering is crucial. Now, you might have heard of the phrase marginal gains. I think it was coined, coined by David Brailsford from Team Sky, the cycling team. And it's a process where you, you accept that you are not going to find one key development that, mean, that means you will win the race. You're not going to find a second a lap or a knot of performance from one thing but you might find 20 tiny little gains and when you sum those 20 up that's enough to win you the race and this is very much a formula one approach and it's also an approach that's pursued by um, an america's cup team uh, both sports are governed by technical rules and regulations and if you want to maximize your performance, you need to exploit these to their limits. You need to not be stopping at the 
the dark line, you need to be into the gray. Both vehicles, so a Formula One car and an America's Copyot, are festooned with sensors that are gathering data all the time. And the team that can analyze and process and understand this data has a huge advantage. Not only do you understand where your weaknesses are, you also understand where your strengths are. So you can work to your strengths, minimize your weaknesses. And another probably more subtle point is that both Formula One and the America's Cup are races. They're not time trials. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to go from the start to the finish. All you have to do is do it quicker than your competitor. Now, it doesn't fundamentally change how you design the boat or the car, but it's an important mindset. It's a racing mindset. Now, I'll just give you a quick uh, example of some of the performance that these racing vehicles can produce. So an America's Copyot, it weighs six and a half tons. It's, for, it's a, a very large vehicle, six and a half tons. With an 18 knot breeze, we were pulling 53 knots across the water. This is a pretty extreme level of performance. Uh, with a Formula One car, if you were to drive your normal road car down a dry road and hit the brakes as hard as you could, you'd decelerate at about 0.8 of a G. Doesn't matter what a G is, it's just a unit of deceleration. If you did the same in a Formula One car, you would decelerate at 5 G. This is six times the amount of deceleration or cornering. It's pretty extreme. There's that much aerodynamic downforce in a Formula One car that if you could flip it upside down and put it on the roof of a tunnel, it would stick there. Now, nobody's ever done this because nobody's that stupid, but it just shows you the amount of performance that's available in these vehicles. <clears throat> 